Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Insight Tonight. And with me are three gentlemen here to help us understand what exactly was happening behind the scenes and beyond what we saw on camera. But before I introduce them, I'd like to kind of set the scene. And to help us do that is none other than our political, senior political reporter, that is Apollo Kamau. And Apollo brings us this story uh, where the decision of the president emanated from weeks of Gen Z protests and so on. But first, let's have a look at what Apollo prepared for us, which will set the stage for the conversation. Take a look. In what mirrors former President Moi Kibake's sacking of the cabinet, after the 2005 national referendum, which he lost, history has repeated itself 19 years later. With the power of the people coming into play, after Gen Z protesters forced President William Ruto to act and clean the mess in his cabinet, starting with a war on corruption, amid public outcry on public officers displaying opulence on social media, as Kenyans continue to grapple with the high cost of living. This is the right time the president must, not should, must stamp authority. For the political temperatures to go down, kill him to Kenya, the president must take action, he must dissolve his cabinet. And the writing was on the wall, not a matter of if but when, after the finance bill proposing punitive taxes was withdrawn shifting the nation's focal attention on large spending in the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. The invasion of parliament and a threat to occupy state house, serving as a no-confidence vote in the Kenya Kwanzaa administration, as public pressure built up when a government Kenyans said was living out of touch with the rest of Kenyans. People are angry and hate public servants because of our own making. The public display of wealth and opulence. With pressure mounting on the president home and abroad, the president had no option but to implement austerity measures while seemingly proposing a government of national unity to include all Kenyans. On Tuesday this week, President Ruto held a closed-door meeting with opposition leader Raila Odinga, who afterwards endorsed dialogue calls that were rejected by fellow Azimio principles. So mimi na kupaliana ya kwamba hata ikiwezekana we can even form a government of national unity bora tukue na amani kwa Kenya yetu. Hakuna ubaya Raila Odinga akileta watu wake waingie serikali. Hakuna ubaya hawa jinsi pia wakichagulia hata wapate waziri waingie serikali. Prime Cabinet Secretary Msalem Davadi survived the purge in order to coordinate government ministries. Apul Kamau, TV47. All right. Now, with that scene setter, I would like to introduce the gentleman that we have with us tonight. First of all, to my immediate right is Mr. Barnabas Kiplagat Boyd. You are a political strategist and analyst. Basically, you understand what's going on. Karibu sana. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, us. Asante. Next to him is Mr. Joe Khalende. Mm. You are an av advocate of the High Court as well as a political analyst. Yes. Karibu sana. Thank you. And finally, uh, not least, we have Mr. Peter Njagi, who's also a uh, man of letters, a man of the law, and you're also a political analyst. Karibu sana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, Karibuni. Yes. Straight away, here's a question. What just happened? I know some people were in the know, but just talk to us a, a little bit about uh, the run-up to this. You know, some people say, many, many to kill, you know, the writing was on the wall. But Miss Njagi, from where you sit, did you see this coming? Did you expect it? Absolutely. I expected it to, to happen sooner than later. Because uh, four things that uh, to, to maybe buttress that particular position. In a time of crisis, in any crisis, the buck stops with the leadership. And the leadership definitely has to act. Otherwise, if it doesn't act, it's exactly bound to what you could <clears throat> describe as self-destruction. And even in the Asian days, you know, uh, even the kings could fatten their best friends just that if there's a calamity, in, uh, maybe a flood, or something to do even with uh, an appraisal, 
the, the friend could be sacrificed and maybe the, 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 the temperatures could, do, could go down. So you expected it? I expected it because uh, heads had to roll, All because right. in the absence of that, uh, the, the head of state who is the president was one to roll. All right, all right. Interesting way to put it. Mr. Kalende, from what you, from what you see, did you expect this? Uh, for, the, for the lovers of history and those who understand geopolitics, most specifically the United States history, in 1944, there was a gentleman called Truman. He was the head of the Congress Committee, which was later called the Truman Committee which was tasked to investigate and help the government to reduce the wastages during the war and to help the government reduce the, to help the government be very effective. Then Truman came into power in 1945 to 1953. And on his desk at the Oval Office, he had a, he had a, he had a sign which, which stated that the buck stops here and the back stops at the president. He had to take action. Mm. All right. And by saying the back stops with the president, it is the president who made the decision of picking and giving people opportunity to serve in his cabinet. And the decision that they made as cabinet secretary, some were good decision for this country, and some actions were bad, uh, some actions led to this protest, and it's the same same president who has to take the action to dismiss the cabinet. All right, all right. Yes. And now, Mr. Boyd. First of all, I think the decision by the president to sack his entire cabinet is timely. Timely in the sense that, um, I mean, there were some certain decisions by the cabinet that didn't inspire the confidence of Kenyans. And um, this government was elected on the promise that it would change the lives of the people of Kenya. A lot of people had uh, hoped that uh, we would have achieved much more by this time. Mm -hmm. uh, the president had indicated in his first retreat to the cabinet in Nanyuki that the cabinet had 18 months through which they would, um, they would um, prove to him that they are capable of running those ministries. So either way, whether the agencies were there, the approval of, or, or the appraisal of the cabinet secretaries was on the way. Mm. And I think um, this is a start that the president is serious about uh, governance issues in this country. It will cascade down to other departments and um, there's been huge support touch from uh, government departments, uh, the security sector. You, this is just the beginning or the tip of the iceberg as more changes are coming. You mean to say there's more changes coming? I mean, more changes and, and more fundamental changes in all sectors of government. And uh, because the president needs to deliver to Kenyans. And, 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 and I think um, just the changes in the cabinet is just a tip of the iceberg. Mm. Yeah. All right. Now, um, a few weeks ago, there was uh, the, the, the time we saw the cabinet sitting in its entirety, few, uh, in its entirety, and we saw all of them, you know, around that long table. Everyone, you know, making their reports and their presentations. Someone took a picture, and and uh, someone captioned it, "The Last Supper," and it, it seemed somewhat poetic. Mr. Njagi. Could you talk to us about your perspective on what was happening behind the scenes, the things that led us to this day when the president announces that his entire cabinet is actually heading home? Behind the scenes. Take us on a journey into the mind of the president over the last few days. Very well. Uh, you have to look at that context in the uh, what really is a cabinet. A cabinet basically as the name suggests, originated from an Italian word, which means gabinetto, which is meant for members of loyalty and nobility. They are supposed to advise the king or the crown or the president or the prime minister in terms of running the affairs of government and in terms of day-to-day -day operation. Now, when the president talks about a dissolution, it means it has ceased, ceased to cease to exist. Mm. 
meaning it's like dissolving a company mm -hmm. or an enterprise. Mm -hmm. So it's an indictment uh, that the members who were meant to be members of nobility and loyalty have failed to execute their mandate in light to Article 153 of the Constitution because they're supposed to advise the president. Secondly, and very importantly, are the membership that was seen there the last supper, as you've correctly insinuated, members of nobility and of loyalty? The answer is a resounding no. Were those members who are sitting in that cabinet inspiring confidence and equal to the task that they are able to execute their mandate and they understand the job description? The answer is an emphatic no. So essentially, if the president really wanted to conduct the business, he was handicapped and a lame duck in terms of uh, executing it. And I must put it, and uh, uh, without any fear of contradiction, uh, that uh, the uprising that we've seen in the last two weeks was actually a catalyst for him to do something that he really wanted to do. But you know that this presidency also was behooved by encumbrances in the form of political parties who had formed the Kenya Kwanzaa government in terms of alliances and promises of people who came to the fold so that the blackmail could also have a reason. So if you uh, suck X, what will happen to Y? And that's why he has even gone ahead and dissolved even the office of the attorney general and the head of civil service. And I must draw parallels that what happened in the Kibaki regime was sucking, meaning that these people have been shown a red card. The words that we are using today and the words that were used today is dissolution. Dissolution goes to the heart and the cracks of government. Remember, there's an entire... Which is a, a, a worse fate? Uh, sacking, uh, you know, or red card, as you put it, or dissolution? Which is a worse or, or, fate? I, I, I think dissolution, as the word insinuates, it seems to, it seems to exist, meaning that the entire unit of executive is non-operational, wow. as we see it right now. And you remember, that's one, one, one third of the three-legged uh, proverbial stool right. because you have the executive, the legislature, judiciary. and the judiciary. So that particular arm um, is dissolved. And uh, in, in the same breath as I close, you remember that dissolution is not a day-to-day -day activity. It happens when there is a crisis because I can only foresee this in what happened recently in Israel when ben Benjamin Netanyahu dissolved his entire six-member uh, uh, war uh, cabinet because of the Gaza uprising or what happened in 2006 uh, when the Somali president also dissolved his cabinet or what happened in 2022 when the Malawian president dissolved the entire cabinet because of corruption uh, purge. So what has happened in Kenya is not something to be taken lightly. It should be looked with the gravitas and the magnitude it is because it has arisen because of a tax issue, which I think is something that will go to the annals of history. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a game changer. Right. It's a fast. All right. Mr. Kalende, yes. the mind of the president in the last few days, do you think he agonized over whether to wipe out the entire cabinet or just make select changes? Uh, if, if, uh, if Kenyans are a good listener and Kenyans can recall very well, the president started talking about his cabinet when uh, they had fa the first retreat about the cabinet which was in a fair amount. He talked about his cabinet. And at some point, for the people who were there, and uh, the media which was there, reported that some cabinet secretary and some PSs who came late for that meeting right. were not allowed into that meeting. Then came when uh, the cabinet and the senior government officials were signing the performance contract at State House. Again, even the president went ahead and said, that if I, the president, know more about your ministry better than you, then there's a problem. Then again, this year, early this year, when uh, the cabinet and the whole uh, executive was in Naivasha, the same thing. The president had to dismiss some reports from certain cabinet and certain government agency. So it is something that has been there, and it is, it is actually what the protests gave us, it was an eye-opener and a clear indication that heads were going to roll. Mm. So I, even the person who said that uh, within that photo that it was Last Supper, he was true, it was true. <laughs> this thing the was prophet. coming. Yes, All right. it was coming. And I think that uh, 
Kenyans need to be alive to the fact that uh, we gave ourselves the 2010 constitution, which was promulgated in August uh, 202. And in that constitution, there is Article 10, the national values that government agency, state officers, and uh, anybody who reads and interprets the constitution must adhere to those national values. And it talks about integrity, it talks about governance, it talks about uh, good governance. And majorly, the issues that we are having today in terms of Kenyans questioning the governance, in terms of Kenyans questioning the cabinet, are squarely elaborated in our constitution. And I'm happy as an advocate that the Kenya that we have today is a Kenya of where people are informed, where people can be able to air their views, where we enjoy the democratic space that we have. Right. So it is something that we need to nurture, we need to embrace, and we need to take charge and allow it to grow within us. Okay. As much as we are saying it's the Gen Z, but it is something that we Kenyans collectively, we feel proud and we accept that we are going to support the president, we are going to support all the measures, and if people are very keen in his uh, statement, he said other raft measures are going to follow. There's so come. we expect more is coming. More is coming. All right, all right. Now we'll, we'll circle back on, on that in a moment. Now we're just about to shift gears to talk about uh, what's next. But I believe uh, the last question I'd like to tackle on this would be, can we do a, a, a small, and, and I know this is a very unfortunate word considering, can we do a, a post-mortem of, of this cabinet? In your opinion, Mr. Boyd, where were the strengths of this cabinet, the cabinet of billionaires, so to speak? Where were the strengths and where were the weaknesses? <clears throat> and I'm setting this up because when we come back, I would like us to talk about the next chapter. But let's talk about this one, the one that's gone. Um, first, uh, let me say that, um, you know, we are unfortunate that um, this administration came in and uh, they've not been so lucky to have a good coverage from the media. Two, uh, it's not nice What do you mean by that, sir? I mean, we've had the worst coverage from the media. and um, The media has been antagonistic. Uh, yes, absolutely. Not supportive of, any gov of this government. And um, to highlight the network of indi individuals, vis uh, few what they've done, uh, there are some people who, are, who inherited wealth, there are some people who have worked out through the journey. They've had uh, their careers in private sector before they joined the government. But all said than done, the truth of the matter is there are people who let down the president. Um, they were given the job to do. They didn't do as expected of them. They are cabinet secretaries who opened their own private offices and you could not find them uh, discharging the duties as required of them. And uh, the president was when meaning when he gave them those positions mm -hmm. and it was up to them to really work very very hard to deliver for the president and for the people of kenya unfortunately without looking at their net worth uh because i cannot trivialize it's not uh, a crime to have money but have them in the right way i mean i don't fault somebody who was rich before he was appointed to cabinet and then there is the fallacy that people in, like Aslas and Mama Mboga should have been appointed in cabinet, which is not true. You say it's a fallacy. No, no, it's a fallacy because somebody who drives a motorcycle, he has no experience, he has no education, how will he function in cabinet? Somebody who is a fender. You see, the... The, 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 the expectation the, was that... The expectation was... Representative. No, inclusive. the expectation was this government cares about the people at the bottom. He didn't say that you will just be picked from the street as a mama mboga and sit in cabinet. I mean, there's a threshold why, uh, or, on how you should be appointed as a cabinet secretary. It's not everybody who can serve in the cabinet because you're supposed to be competent, you're supposed to have the qualification, and you're supposed to have the necessary experience or the requisite experience to, to, to really drive policy and engage uh, in all, within all the key people in the ministry. But having said that, the president made changes, I mean, in the top hierarchy, but beneath the ministries is where there was real sabotage mm. by, by people who are not supportive of this government. 
And I think the president should crack the whip further, even as we move forward. Like even the last, um, the last uh, uh, demonstration, there was some real inaction of uh, some police officers who never wanted to, to, to really uh, protect property and life of Kenyans. So we expect that more changes will be coming on the way. And um, president was let down in a big way by people he hadn't trusted with responsibility. Mr. Boyd, just before we shift to the other gentleman, this is, I believe, just tonight is the second time you've mentioned the word sabotage. Just how deep does it go? It's deep because, you know, look, I think for some reason, people over time have and then, not um, realized... Sorry, just as you answer that, is it sabotage or incompetence? There are two issues here. There is sabotage and incompetence. Sabotage by people who are charged with responsibility and they either deliberately through omission or commission, don't do as required of them. Two, there are some cases of incompetence where people have been given positions which they don't deserve. And um, when you are given that position, you are inept in that position and you cannot discharge your duties as required and uh, as part of the functions of the ministry. So we expect a more, a more experienced cabinet in, in, in the coming days. We expect that the president would take his time to really consider the people he'd bring on board so that he can actually take off on, on all the all right. agendas that he has for the country. All right. Mr. Khalene, I know you're yes. itching to jump in. You did say the buck stops, I mean, uh, at least as far as President Truman, and it's become part of common language, mm -hmm. especially when we discuss governance issues, that the buck stops with the chief executive. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Boyd has raised an interesting perspective, one that there may be saboteurs amongst government officials and deep inside the ministries, beneath the cabinet level. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who takes responsibility for, for them? Who takes responsibility for the, the successes are easy to take care of, but the failures of this cabinet, for example, and the failures of the ministries and the, uh, you know, some of them, like Mr. Boyd is suggesting, the, the issues that stem from within, the systemic issues that stem from within. Who takes responsibility for that? Uh, the person who takes uh, the achievement is the, pers the same person who takes uh, the responsibility of the failure. But uh, from what my good colleague here has raised about uh, sabotage, for me, I look at it from a different angle. And for me, it's about separating politics from the real issues that affect Kenyans. Uh, instead of saying sabotage or instead of saying competence, we can see clearly, if you have been very keen, there are issues to do with the politics. And it, it, started, it, it, it started like an impulsion from within. There's a, there's a time where the, president, the deputy president went rogue. The deputy president disappeared for a whole week. When he reappeared, he said he had gone to the mountain to pray. We have seen uh, uh, people running up and down in this country. They want to be, they want to be king, kingpins. So within the first Two years of this government, we saw people angling for political expedience instead of delivering to the common monainchi. There are people who are already planning for 2027, others were planning for 2032 to inherit uh, the current president even before his first term is over. So these are some of the challenges. And now we have an opportunity as a country. And the president has an opportunity as a country to call everybody to order, including the deputy president, that gentlemen, it's time to deliver to Kenyans. And it's time for politics will come, 2027 will come. And he said yesterday when he was in Kajado, that in 2027, Kenyans will mark an exam. So it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it is, a, it is that opportunity where we need to, to move together as a country now and ensure that the people who are given responsibility to serve, they must deliver to Kenyans and they must offer solution to the problems that affect Kenya. There's a question you asked earlier about the strength within this, uh, this outgoing, immediate outgoing cabinet. Mm -hmm. One of their strengths, I think, that, uh, that, uh, that has taken the president quite some time for two years to actually to come to the conclusion to dissolve it, it is because of the comradeship 
within this cabinet. What do you mean by that? Comradeship is that uh, basically most of the people, a huge number of the people within this cabinet are people who have worked with the president, the journey. And are the people who understand the vision that the president sold to Kenyans about Mamamboga and Namutua Pikipiki. And I think the president was at a point where he believed that these are the people mm. who shared the same ideology. These are the people who shared the same uh, uh, theory to understand the problem of common Mwanainchi and be able to solve it. But they appear to have let him down. You, it looks like you cannot rely on uh, the comradeship anymore. <laughs> all right, all right. Mr. Njagi, I want you to come in. And uh, I want you to come in and, and maybe launch us into a slightly different direction. Let's talk about the implication, the impact of this sort of, uh, this sort of move, dissolving the cabinet. I mean, learning from what happened with Kibaki, the examples you're giving in Malawi with the, with the president over there, all the different places. A, a, a move like this is, is never received, you know, humbly and kindly and with business as usual attitudes. Things have shaken. Dust is in the air. Talk to me about what we're likely to see when the dust settles. Very well. Uh, what happened in the last two weeks, I can only equate it to the Pride's Purge, which occurred in 1648 in England, when the army presented members of House of Commons from accessing it who were considered hostile. And I think that's what happened to the Gen Z movement when they actually occupied Parliament and the membership, which they felt voted yes, would have faced their wrath. What I also have to look into is that the president seems to be making the best from a crisis. Remember uh, that he may have wanted to do this thing before, but the political and uh, other ramifications would outweigh the, the motive. But now he has had a very good, maybe clear-cut uh, road. Are you, saying, are you saying the crisis uh, created uh, a chance for the president to take initiative, retake initiative rather, for, for, for the discussion, the political discussion of the country? Is that what the, you're saying? The, the script seems to be that he has made lemonade juice from the lemons that was given. Mm. And I think uh, that's something you have to give it up to him because now the way it is, uh, the, the ramification would be much softer, there's a softer landing as opposed if it was done maybe three weeks ago. All right. Well, they say the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. Now, this lemonade that we're talking about, the proof of it will be in the tasting. Talk to us about that, the, how this lemonade is going to taste, the impact of this. Uh, are these people going to take this lying down? Uh, what sort of uh, political impact are we expecting from such a move? The narrative has changed uh, due to what has happened in this country in the last three weeks, and only somebody who is foolhardy mm. or just takes it lightly that now the political uh, conversation is even ha happening in different uh, uh, areas which, which are unknown of, like this X space. So that even these politicians, like today I was in a funeral, they are being denied an opportunity to speak. If it was three weeks ago, then it would be our people are being fought. So, but now that narrative is dead, dead on arrival, dead as a dodo, it won't sell. The ramification thereafter is what he does with this particular uh, opportunities have been presented to him. Mm -hmm. Remember that the constitution and civil justice situation whereby the cabinet would be not less than 14 and not exceeding 24. But he has been operating on a 21 member committee, which I think is on the higher tier. So even for him to rebuild the confidence which he desperately needs, is he needs to look in terms of the numbers, in terms of also uh, managing the wage bill, which is a big question as was raised by this particular uprising. The other question that maybe should be looked into is that uh, what was the role of this cabinet secretary? Because I hear that maybe there was sabotage or things like that. But also you must also keep in mind that the role of the cabinet secretary is to advise the president in terms of running the face of the, of, the, of, of, the, of the government and the country. But also what has it that the one to be advised advises his advisors so that then uh, is your advice being taken upon? So it is also very important for the president also to have uh, an introspective view in terms of, of also listening to advice, in terms of also uh, giving these people attitude to do their work. Because you remember that during the Kabaki regime, which was a fairly uh, successful regime, 
compared to the other uh, particular uh, other, other, other presidencies that we've had. When you talk about Thika Superhighway, hardly do you remember the PS was in charge of roads. Hardly do people talk about the one who was in charge of uh, the Ministry of uh, Roads and Public Works. But the credit goes to the president, who was Mwai Kibaki. So what is good for the goose is good for the gander. So if he wants credit for the good work that is done, he must also be ready to know he's also going to take the blame if the cabinet fails, because we know that the f uh, fish rots right. from the head. All right. Santi Sana. All right. Now, uh, at this point, I'd like us to take a short break, a short breather. When we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be looking at this um, for posterity. What, what next? Those are some of the questions we're going to be digesting and uh, extracting insight from them. But first, a short break. We'll be right back. <laughs>